It's been almost 127 years since the first paying public screening of moving images by the Lumière brothers on the 28th of December 1895 took place in Paris, and it was a roaring success. Since then, cinema and television have evolved into a staple form of entertainment, but, more importantly, central to how we construct social narratives about ourselves. Be it through the written or spoken word, art or moving images, these forms of storytelling have become the equivalent of sitting around the communal fire and constructing stories about the best and worst of humanity, deconstructing who we are and giving meaning to our existence. When put in terms like that, storytelling becomes something more than just frivolous entertainment. It's a way to expose ourselves to ourselves, a way to provoke, reframe and influence. So how we tell our stories, who tells them, who is included and who is not, who is framed as the hero and who is framed as the villain, matters. Come with me as I take you through a history of sapphic representation in film and TV, from the silent films where we get our first sapphic kiss on celluloid, to the invisible years where homosexuality was routinely censored, to the slow 50-year emergence from that era. When was the first lesbian film made? How have sapphic women been portrayed in film and TV over the decades? What are the landmark moments that have helped move the needle forward? I'll be looking at that and more in this history of sapphic film and TV. The presence of queerness in cinema was there from the start. In fact, an experiment in 1895 to synchronise sound and image saw two men dancing a short pas de deux and it was titled the Dickinson Experimental Sound Film, or I've also seen it called the Gay Brothers. The men themselves were probably not gay, but it is to my knowledge the first queer image, if you will, to ever be captured. If you're curious, I have linked to a video of this along with links to a lot of the other films referenced in this video. The use of queer images were, in fact, quite common. In the early days, moving images were shown anywhere a screen in a dark space could be put up. This could be a fairground or a music hall where vaudeville shows were performed. Vaudeville was popular until the 1930s and was a form of entertainment where various acts would be performed from comedic skits to circus acts. Among those acts, you might expect to see men and women dressing up as the opposite sex. You may know about this from the popular Suffolk miniseries, Tipping the Velvet that they influenced the experimental world of film is hardly surprising. In fact, cross-dressing for comedic effect seems something of a staple in the early days of comedy. Examples of this can be seen in 1912's Making a Man of Her, in which a woman dresses up as a man to get a job, and 1914's A Florida Enchantment, in which a woman swallows a magic seed which turns her into a man. Superficially, these films are queer, in Making a Man of Her, we see two women take a particular interest in the protagonist that persists even once the ruse is up. In A Florida Enchantment, we see two women dancing together and the female protagonist flirting with a woman. Once she cuts her hair and starts wearing men's clothes, she is accepted as being male and gets engaged. However, the resolution of these films is the return to the status quo. There is no real queer narrative here. The gender swapping is for the comedy of errors that arises from the gender bending and doesn't place a critical eye on gender or gender expression, except in its attempt to reinforce what is normal and therefore good by society's standards, that is, cis heterosexuality. In Ich möchte kein Mann sein, I don't want to be a man, the gender bending is used to highlight how restricted the protagonist is as a woman. She ends up falling for a potential suitor when she gets drunk and makes out with him while masquerading as a man. And while there is no apparent issue given to the suitor thinking that he's kissing a man, in the end she decides being a man is hard and reverts to presenting as a female. The interesting part about these and other similar films of the time is how the woman dressed as a man is considered far more palatable than the man dressing as a woman. The societal default being male and the weaker sex being female, a woman in men's clothing served to reinforce the superiority of the patriarchal paradigm. It was the effeminate men known as sissies that were to be feared. It was therefore they who were the true butt of jokes and a source of ridicule in these early films. In A Florida Enchantment, it is the man dressed as a woman who is chased into a river and then drowns while the woman dressed as a man looks on from the safety of her room. As Vito Russo in the book The Celluloid Closet points out, while sissy men have always signalled a rank betrayal of the myth of male superiority, tomboy women have seemed to reinforce that myth and have often been indulged in acting it out. 
We see it in moments like the 1930 film Morocco, which features a brief kiss between protagonist Amy and a woman. But far from being sapphic representation, it was used for the sensational effect in a time where censorship wasn't yet being enforced seriously. That was to come. And it didn't detract from the heterosexual triangle that was the core romance of the movie. Using two women kissing for sensationalism is something that has persisted, as we'll discuss later, and we see it in fact with the very first lesbian kiss on celluloid. It was during an orgy scene in the 1922 film Manslaughter. The presence of the kiss, a perfunctory blink and you miss it moment, was there merely to show the debauched depravity of ancient Rome as a contrast to good Christian values. Ten years later, in 1932, the director of the film, Cecile B. DeMille, made another film where he used lesbianism as a shorthand, again, for the depravity of the Roman Empire during the rise of Christianity, among other things. It also featured a rather disturbing dance where a Roman woman tries, I guess, to seduce the good Christian girl. Apparently, the outcry at this content was in no small way responsible for the US censorship code knuckling down on displays of depravity in 1934. In Germany, however, following the end of World War I and before the Nazis got into power in 1933, there was a brief reprieve in their censorship that allowed the emergence of the first gay and lesbian films. Anderes als die anderen, different from the others, in 1919, took a sympathetic look at male homosexuality and was the work of homosexual reform advocates, even if it still ended with tragedy. The first lesbian film, Mädchen in Uniform, or Girls in Uniform, would take another 12 years to be made. In the meantime, there was one notable lesbian character also in a German production, one that is far more sympathetic than I honestly expected. Die Box de Pandora, or Pandora's Box, in 1929, gave us the first lesbian character in a film where Countess Anne Geschwitz is infatuated with the protagonist, Lulu. Amongst the whirlwind devastation the ardour Lulu engenders in both men and, well, one woman, Countess Geschwitz, at least from my modern perspective, appears a largely unproblematic betrayal of a sapphic character. Perhaps her jealous gaze would have, at the time, seemed predatory and unpalatable, but she never steps over any boundaries and, in fact, is willing to sacrifice much for Lulu's safety. Her lesbianism does lead to a bad ending for her. In an attempt to save Lulu from her downward spiral, she flirts and is, it looks like, raped by a man, so it's not a hopeful portrayal by any stretch. She is suitably punished for her deviance, a theme that will be oft-repeated in the coming century. But she herself was not presented as a villain or a predator, but at least to me, a rather sympathetic character. Three years later, in 1931, Mädchen in Uniform was released as the first lesbian film. Protagonist Manuela is a newly arrived student at a girls' boarding school who develops a romantic attachment to her teacher. This film was based on a play and was generally well received internationally, although there were, in fact, two endings to this film. In one, Manuela commits suicide by jumping from the stairwell, in the other, she is rescued by her classmates. The tragic version was used in the US and much of continental Europe because, of course, lesbianism must be punished. Additional editing was also made to take out any allusions to lesbianism from the film. The film incidentally only made it to the US because Eleanor Roosevelt, being the sapphic that she was, was a fan of the movie. This film, like Die Bugs de Pandora, paints the lesbian character of Manuela without villainizing her. What it does, though, is lean into the narrative that her deviant tendencies drive her insane. Geheilt. Befunden. Du darfst mich nicht so lieb haben. Warum? Two years later, the Nazi party got into power and burnt Anderes as the Anderen, and it was thought lost for many decades. It now exists as a reconstruction of the original only. Mädchen in Uniform escaped such a fate because, back then, woman's sexuality was still something of a myth and it didn't challenge status quo in the same way gay men did. I think it also had something to do with the fact that Mädchen in Uniform, along with a number of other sapphic films set in all-girls boarding schools, could be dismissed as pubescent girls exploring burgeoning sexuality in the safety of same-sex affection until the real men came along to sweep them up in perfectly heterosexual relationships. The sentiment is well encapsulated in the 1957 film The Twilight Girls. I'm used to loves and hatreds among you girls. They're not forever. Now don't you cry over it. 
the few years you're here at Berlin are really just a short prologue to your life out there. Before you become the wives and mothers you will be, you are these mysterious, secretive little twilight girls. No longer children, but not yet women. With Germany coming under Nazi rule in 1933 and with the US, already the leader of the international film industry, tightening their codes, the progressive films dwindled and sapphic representation, when allowed to exist, would not live up to these humble beginnings. While European cinema led the way initially, the First World War saw Hollywood solidify itself as the global leader. The 1930s ushered in the Great Depression, where cinema attendance dropped dramatically as punters struggled to afford tickets. In response, the film industry used more scandalous plots to attract eyeballs. Take off your clothes. Get in here and tell me all about it. This didn't necessarily go down well with conservative and religious groups, in particular the Catholic Church, and the film industry faced the possibility of mass boycotts they couldn't afford. So, in 1934, Hollywood began to enforce the Motion Picture Production Code, also known as the Hayes Code. This was a list of restrictions on what could be shown in a film that had technically been in effect since 1930. This was not just done to placate the Catholic Church, but also to dissuade the government from stepping in as an external censorship force. The code established a list of don'ts and be carefuls in film that encompassed things such as provocative dances to scenes of childbirth, men and women in bed together, open-mouthed kissing, and this one is wild, white slavery. It sought to take moral nuance and make it black and white. Therefore, good must always win and evil must always fail. Among these and other restrictions, it also forbade the depiction of sexual perversion. Perversion being homosexuality, of course. To ensure adherence to this code, each script was carefully read line by line by the Production Code Administration and notes given on anything that violated that code. Due to how the industry was structured, it meant that a movie without approval from the Production Code Administration wouldn't get a commercial release. Consequently, queer characters were largely scrubbed from existence in US films. There were vestiges to be gleamed, however, and it wasn't pretty. Gone was Greta Garbo as Queen Christina in 1933, casually kissing a woman and proclaiming, I shall die a bachelor. And instead we got 1936 Dracula's daughter, a vampire woman whose soulless eyes seem to devour the young woman who has come to pose for her. Why are you looking at me that way? Won't I do? Yes, you'll do very well indeed. And later looms over the damsel of the movie ominously. She may not be explicitly called a lesbian, but the implications are obvious. Her just dessert is received in the form of her death by the movie's end, and I imagine the sole reason such a portrayal was approved by the censors. This personification of evil was seen again in the 1945's House on 92nd Street, where the lesbian cross-dressing Nazi is shot dead in the final action of the film, and in 1950's Cage, to where the matron of the woman's prison is characterised as being a little too interested in her charges. Sit down in this chair, it's kind of roomy. While also being a brutal bully, and for it, she is killed. A US movie which seemed to defy the negative portrayals during this era was Young Man with a Horn. Amy North is a mysterious, somewhat cryptic character who the male protagonist falls in love with. She marries him despite not enjoying his kisses nor wanting him to touch her. It's clear that this is not for her and their marriage crumbles. You're so confused yourself, you got me confused. I'm not confused any longer. I'm fed up with you. I'm sick of you trying to touch me. She seems to prefer the company of another woman. I thought you were class, like a real high note you hit once in a lifetime. That's because I couldn't understand what you were saying half the time. You're a sick girl, Amy. You'd better see a doctor. What makes this unique for the time is that there is no punishment, no comeuppance for her implied homosexuality. Films outside of the US offered only marginally more hopeful films during this time period. In 1936, the French film La Garçonne followed the story of a woman who escaped an arranged marriage and pursued a career as an artist. In the process, she falls into, and I quote, carnal temptations and artificial pleasures, one of which, apparently, is lesbianism. While the film has some shots of queer ladies in it amongst the general debauchery and opium smoking, 
and allusions to it are couched in vague enough terms that I was wondering how this was taken as explicit representation, but apparently it was. Being a French film, the ending is not deadly, however, it is merely heterosexual. The protagonist does not have to die for her temporary sapphism. Je crois sortir d'un cauchemar. Another French film, Club de Femmes, or Woman's Club, offered a more explicit sapphic character. Based in a hotel for working-class girls, one of the residents finds herself attracted to a pretty, if vapid, girl. She allows her jealousy to drive a wedge between her crush and the boyfriend, and later, when her crush is defiled by the manipulations of the front desk girl, she turns to murder. And then she exiles herself to a leper colony. So perhaps not death, but one could argue the next worst thing to death, a life of misery and isolation working with the world's most reviled and pitiable. The 1949 Swedish film Törst had a mentally unstable character teeting on the edge of seduction by a lesbian, something so awful she drowned herself. 1955's Diabolique tried to remove the explicit lesbian content from the source novel, but it resulted in sapphic subtext, with betrayal and death for one and jail for the other. The most positive film was Olivia in 1951, based off a semi-autobiographical novel. It was renamed to Pit of Loneliness in English before it would be approved for the US market, an attempt to echo what is generally acknowledged to be the first lesbian novel in 1928, Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall, a novel which ended in suicide. Olivia follows a young student who has recently come to a boarding school and she finds herself having a passionate attachment to her teacher. The teacher, Mademoiselle Julie, and her rival, Mademoiselle Cara, are implied to have been in a relationship together and the film reads very queer. At the time, I'm sure the school came across as a hotbed for scandalous lesbian activity, which, as a modern sapphic viewer, makes this a delightful find. However, the ending did involve tragedy for one of the characters. The reason that this film was able to make it to the US was because by then the film studios had been court ordered to sell their movie theatres in 1948 and it allowed for movie theatres to import and show foreign films without the need of US censorship approval. This marked the beginning of a loosening up of the rigid control the Catholic Church had over the US film industry. However, it would still be some time before the code would be abolished completely or that sapphic representation would flourish. As society's restrictive mores began to loosen in the 60s, the Hayes Code had no choice but to adapt if it wished to retain an illusion of control. It didn't signal a sudden increase in positive queer representation, it just meant that it was more explicitly spoken about. The Children's Hour, the first lesbian film riding that change, had the lesbian hang herself because of how disgusted she felt at her sapphic feelings, echoing the sentiments of the time. I resented your plans to marry. Maybe because I wanted you. Maybe I've wanted you all these years. I can't stand to have you touch me. Oh, I feel so damn sick and dirty. I can't stand it anymore. But it did mark the beginning of a new wave of films featuring lesbian characters. Along with the type of sapphic characters we've seen until then, there was now the lesbian themed film like the French Italian vampire film Et Mourir de Plaisir or Blood and Roses which came out in 1960 and based on the novel Carmilla. It was succeeded by other vampire films like Daughters of Darkness in the 70s. One of the more disturbing finds was Valerie and Her Week of Wonders, a Czech film with its 13 year old protagonist in a surreal allegory of which had suggestions of sapphism. What I saw of this film as I researched left me feeling uncomfortable with its <laughs> Then there were films like Japan's Munji in 1964, looking at an obsessive lesbian affair with a tragic ending, and Les Biches, a threesome between two women and a man. These films can easily be seen as an extension of the patriarchal film industry as the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s swept the world. None of these stories were there to explore what being a sapphic meant, but was there instead to exploit the idea of two women together. Now not only were queer women monsters, but sexy monsters. With representation being what it was, finding sapphic images of oneself was a dangerous business. The images were present, but also narrowly associated with death, destruction and mental illness. With the weight of a world that viewed queer sexuality as a horrible perversion, where to find safe images, happy possibilities, how to imagine a positive future when every story denied that possibility. Enter subtext. 
the taking of a story that is superficially heterosexual but is coded with certain telltale signs that speak to the queer experience. Ones that the general audience is unlikely to clock but provide enough scope that a happy queer story is imaginable. These are markers that are not acknowledged in text but are still tantalizingly present. Stories like 1933's Little Woman with the tomboy Joe who is independent and longs for adventure and self-determination while her sisters seem happy to comply with expectations. This version of the classic story was played by Catherine Hepburn, a lesbian icon, with a decided androgynous edge to her, who would go on to play a gender-bending role in Sylvia Scarlet in 1935 where she dresses quite convincingly as a boy for a portion of the film. Then there was the palpable tension between Catherine Hepburn and Ginger Rogers and Stage Door if one chose to see it. And you're wonderful. And you're and wonderful. And I'm wonderful too. You now come on, let wonderful. me help you take off your things. All About Eve also sported tension that could be interpreted as sapphic and apparently Eve was originally conceived as a lesbian but, well, censorship. 1952's musical Calamity Jane was a film dripping in sapphic possibility. Gosh almighty. The prettiest thing I ever seen. Never knew a woman could look like that. It's unfortunate it also was such a hideously racist film. Calamity Jane is a gun-toting tomboy out in the Old West who can ride and shoot like a man. She seems quite taken with Katie Brown and they become fast friends who move in together with exactly all the subtext you'd expect. The love interests that ensure a perfectly heterosexual ending aside, it's easy to imagine Calamity Jane singing a secret love about Katie. It's hardly surprising that such films became the favourite of sapphic women yearning for positive images of themselves. Here, there was hope, possibility and safety from society's pernicious punishment of their queerness. Even as representation has improved, subtext has remained popular for sapphic women, even today. In 1968, just in time for the Stonewall riots of 1969, amidst the gay rights, women's rights and civil rights movement in the US, the Hayes Code was officially ended and replaced with the MPAA rating system that is still in use today. Ending the Hayes Code was pivotal and its effect quickly felt. While this was a code specific to the US, as an international leader in entertainment, it held, and still does today, a skewed importance in global storytelling. So it's not surprising we began to see some breakthrough moments happening around that time. But the next breakthrough didn't come from the movies, it came on television. If you want to find out about how TV led the way in representation, be sure to be subscribed to get notified of part two of this history of sapphic film and TV. There's still a lot of really interesting history to get through. In the meantime, take a guess in the comments at what year and in what country we got the first sapphic kiss on TV and when we got the first happy ending for a sapphic couple on TV. I'm curious to know if you are in the know. Until next time, lady lovers.